Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now, it's the time to understand more so that we may fear less. With the blessings of our honorable chairperson, Madam Manjushri Khedan, we commence with the most awaited event of celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in the Field of Science. To recognize their contribution as the agent of changes at the onset, we extend a hearty welcome to our esteemed panelists, our most adorable alumni, all the students and mentors of the Ashoka Group of Schools, and all the invited guests to the program. We sincerely hope that this program becomes resourceful for the students to aim higher and explore the amazing world of science to reach their destination. Enjoy and have a splendid stay forward. Thank you. The 11th February is celebrated as the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. This day is celebrated to recognize the achievements of women in science and to promote the participation of girls and women in fields of STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This day is celebrated to raise awareness of the gender gap in the STEM fields, to promote the inclusion of women and girls. STEM education and values. This day is also an opportunity to celebrate the success of women in science and to inspire the next generation of female scientists. Now we have a small presentation. Women's scientific breakthroughs have often been overlooked and minimized. Did you know of these incredible achievements by Indian women in science? Number 1. Dr. Archana Sharma Project – Discovery of Higgs boson particle Dr. Sharma is a senior scientist at the CERN laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. She was the only Indian woman to be involved in the discovery of the Higgs boson particle in 2012, which could help us understand dark matter more fully. She worked on designing and prototyping the present generation of muon detectors, crucial for the gold-plated discovery channel for the Higgs boson. She has also helped make CERN accessible to Indian students by facilitating student visits and providing prestigious internships. Number 2. Dr. Tessie Thomas Project Agni-4 and Agni-5 Missile Programs Dr. Thomas was the project director for DRDO's Agni-4 and 5 missiles right from their inception. Hailed as Agni Putri, Dr. Thomas was the first woman to head an Indian missile project. It's really challenging because when, when we talk about defense research, it's uh, highly committed and uh, exceptionally accurate results uh, it's to do with uh, nuclear weapons when I talk about uh, if, uh, if it's an Agni missile. She was crucial in developing the Agni 5's multiple targetable re-entry vehicle MIRV. She also ensured that the intercontinental ballistic missile withstood massive velocity and temperatures upon re-entry to the atmosphere. Number 3. Nagarajan Padmavati Project – A Superior Water Purifying System Dr. Padmavati is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Materials Engineering at IISC Bengaluru and first author of the scientific paper about the system. In the majority of water boxes in India. Number 2. Ritu Karidhal Narani Hardina Anurakite Project did you know the women behind the launch? Anuradha TK is the Geosat Program Director at ISRO Satellite Center. She is the Senior Woman Officer at ISRO. 
When she joined Israel in 1982, her appointment was a courageous and awe-inspiring achievement as only five women from her batch managed to join Israel. Ritu Karidhal and Nandini Harinath were deputy operations directors of the mission. After the success of the Mars mission, many dubbed India's women scientists the women from Mars. Ms. Karidhal humbly responded, I am a woman from Earth, an Indian woman who got an amazing opportunity. Number 5. Supriya V. Vartak and Divyanka Ayer, Project Contributors to Cancer Drug. Ms. Supriya V. Vartak and Ms. Divyanka Ayer contributed in the discovery of a molecule that can be used in cancer drugs. The new drug Disarib can kill cancer cells overproducing a protein called BCL2. It has been found effective against a range of cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and colon cancer. However, the drug is still in a preclinical trial stage and it will take a while before we see Disarib on pharmacy shelves. Share this video to spread word of these amazing women's achievements. To start the journey of inspiration and empowerment, we have a message from our very first panelist, Ms. Akshita Sethi, who is an MBBS doctor and is rendering her services in government and hospital at home. A video would be shown by Akshita Sethi. Doctors, well, they are the saviors and they are the creators of life. Don't we all uh, are thankful to our doctors because they save our lives and she is a, doing a noble profession. She is a leader in her field and we all are grateful to her, to all the doctors of the world. Ma'am is not audible. Can we please increase the volume? We will play it later again. By then, we can move on to our next panelist. Now, we have amongst us Ms. Romila Joshi, who we still remember. who we still remember for her intelligence and her witty nature. Currently, she is working as a management consultant in data science in a leading power company at California. Now, over to you, Ms. Romina. We are all eager to hear your success story. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. OK. So first of all, we'll go on first name basis. I'm Romila. You, go, you guys are going to address me as Romila. The only ma'am in this room are our teachers, okay? So we are all first name basis here. So how's it? How's everything with you all? It's so good to see you. I'm so overwhelmed. I can see Sukriti. It practically feels like, yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't hear Akshita talk, but it, it feels really nice. So um, 
I would not take much of your time and I'll just cut to the cheese. I was pretty much like you guys um, doing all these, uh, you know, events and stuff uh, when I was in school. And I'm from the batch of 2013, Sukriti. She's my, she's my classmate. Hi, Sukriti. She's a doctor. She's doing, she's doing the noble work. <laughs> and I can see Vidushi, who is my senior. I see Neeti, who is my junior. So it's really, really great to see everyone here. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the school for giving us an opportunity to actually speak to uh, fellow women. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. I think it's a great initiative. I see Akhilesh, sir. Hello, sir. How are you? Um, I Marty, ma'am, I can't see you, but yeah, it's it's really good to see everyone. Okay, I'll quickly share my screen. I don't know how many times in my day I say that, but uh, this is the one where I'm actually elated about. Okay, let me know if you guys can see my screen. Can you guys see it? No. No. Not yet. Okay. Let me try again. Can you guys see a presentation? Yes, that's Okay. Okay, so I want to start with, can you guys see the presentation? I mean, here I am going to talk about data science and we cannot share a screen. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll just take one more shot at it and then otherwise I'll just use presentation as a cue and I can talk through it, okay? Can you see it now? Okay, so first things first, I always like to open this discussion what are these what are But uh, this is what we keep hearing as we grow up, but these degrees are actually super important. So hi everyone, I'm Romila from Batch of 2013. I did uh, I did my um, BTEC from Computer Scientist from Pandit University, then I did my Master's in Data Science and Analytics from IIT Kanpur. And right now I'm the West Coast lead for decision sciences in California. Uh, so uh, I quickly want to talk about uh, what I actually learned from school. And it's the drive to innovation. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So first of all, the drive to innovation. And I would say that every, every day when I'm working, I realize that the world is a stage, I think. I remember Cranville was one place which actually gave me that sort of platform. We used to have all these competitions, extracurricular activities, and whatnot. Uh, and it actually kept us for handling real world conversations. So now, uh, you know, I, I don't feel intimidated because that's kind of hardwired in my system. Um, and then the third and most important thing is self discipline. Uh, I still struggle, but if I were to talk about it, I think it teaches you that because when you're going to grow up, nobody is going to tell you it's 9 a.m. to go to work. 12 years, you go in and out, we go to school, and it just becomes a part of our system. And we actually taught me uh, so. I'm going to talk about contribution to science and tech. Uh, so a little bit about my job. I'm a, I'm a consultant and I work for pharma companies. You might have heard the names uh, like Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, 
Anjan, Sanfi. So these are pretty much my students. And what I try to do here is I work with a lot of data. And uh, since AI is right now, so which involves a lot of mathematics and statistics. And that is really good data. So that's pretty much what I <laughs> what I'm good at. So um, I try to, unlike the real doctors in the room, I try to actually predict real world patient level outcomes. So I work with these funds and I could understand, uh, you know, what could possibly happen. So when I was briefly going to talk about one of the projects that I was doing for my client, where I tried to sort of, you know, using real world patient who could be the patients who would potentially have a heart attack in the next three years? And I think it's a very, very powerful thing. And you could actually nip it in the bud and you know, kind of improve your health If you can actually predict before the doctors uh, can actually do it. Um, and I also think like uh, we cut to the areas, a little, a little bit of, uh, you know, um, trivia about me. When I was in high school, I wanted to choose biology <laughs> as my, uh, you know, there's this, this is huge debate whether you go for mathematics or commerce or biology. And I secretly wanted to uh, study biology, but I didn't end up doing that. I instead took up maths and I was pretty sad about it. Forward 2013, 2023, I'm actually helping uh, in the sector, which involves a lot of biology. So life can be very interesting in that fashion. And I feel when it comes to science specifically, uh, and as we're as we're growing and, and as you know, so many things um, are coming across in this world, it's not necessarily important uh, what field you pick up. You can actually choose what to do if you, you know, with your life uh, as you go forward. So I cut across therapeutic areas. I work with oncology, which is cancer. I work with general medicine. I work with internal medicine. And I and I like that because uh, I, I feel like I'm making making a change. I'm bringing innovation. It gets hectic sometimes. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. Uh, I briefly want to talk about what advanced analytics is. And uh, it actually involves not just playing around with a lot of data, but also kind of doing some machine learning models that you can actually predict future. Now, everybody wants to predict the future, but where does it come into action? So this comes into action in boardroom strategies. So the day in my life looks like uh, building these uh, advanced models, coming up with recommendations, going to the CXOs and the directors of these big pharma companies and telling them, hey, this is what you should be doing with your business. And I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and because it's uh, women, it's a where women, so I want to say that we're actually kind of breaking the glass ceiling and we're trying the world. And I was asked about what do I do to manage stress? So I want to say good work and no play makes uh, Jill a dull girl. I was very bad at scripts. I was very, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a person who was good at public speaking and good at dramatics. But if you ask me for a mile, I would be like, oh my God. And then I moved to California where all people do for their free time is, you know, go on hikes, go on runs, go to the beach, surf. And I thought to myself, okay, this is one thing that I didn't pay attention to in school and it's coming and inviting me back. So as you see the picture, I eat a lot. <laughs> so stress management, I prefer. That's, you know, Thanksgiving meal that I had with my friends. We cooked. And I prefer to do some sort of physical activity for the endorphins. Uh, and that's me rock climbing. Uh, yeah. Near around here. And sometimes I go for a this is so I, live, I live in Los Angeles, California, and Malibu is like a 20 minute drive from my place. So I go here for hikes, and it's a Pacific, it's closer to the Pacific Ocean, so there are a lot of beaches. So I travel on the weekends, I go to so this picture is from San Diego. So, so for stress management, I prefer to detox over the weekend, not try to work, not try to stress about and still learning. And then I give uh, a call because I live so far away from them. 
Okay, so this is what I wanted to talk about. Any more questions? I would be happy to take them. Thank you, Ms. Romila. That was okay. really, really insightful and have encouraged all of us. Okay. Now, I do have a question for you. Okay, tell me. What are the things that we should care about while we are moving to other countries for studies or for jobs? Okay, that's a good question. I think uh, especially with the kind of, uh, you know, uh, environment that we are currently growing up in, uh, it actually kind of is very dynamic, it's very fluid. And uh, I'm very honest with you, Bella is one of the coolest schools to be in. <laughs> I don't know how Gen Z are hanging out these days, but uh, I think my school kind of prepared me to, um, I don't even know what you guys are right. <laughs> I don't think it's just me, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is a uh, few things that you should absolutely consider is it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of uh, that you'll have to bring within yourself, uh, which means being able to live by yourself in a country with no, no support, social support, and uh, you kind of need to learn how to be independent. And your school is going to prepare you for most of it, but you need to have that sort of confidence that if you can, you in fact will. And I would say from a perspective of, uh, you know, something quick wins that you can do is communication skills. Uh, if you're a great communicator, you can actually uh, go anywhere, you know. And uh, I mean, it's a bit of a colonial hangover, but English is the most spoken language throughout the world. So if you think about going to the US, then that would be really helpful if you have like good communication skills. It gets intimidating in the beginning, but you pretty much get the hang of it. And that's like one quick advice that I could give you. Things you guys can figure out that you're way more smarter than I am. I mean, you're already asking questions about coming to abroad. I didn't know about if I was going to move to US when I was in school. So um, I think that would be like a quick, quick start. And apart from that, uh, try to be on top of your academics if you're moving for studies because you know, it's a very performance intensive environment. Uh, so you get judged on your uh, capabilities and on top of your game. So if you're planning to move for studies, you will have to be good at them. <laughs> okay. Thank you, ma'am. The words have inspired all of us, and I'm sure we're all going to apply it in our lives. Now, if okay. the audience has any questions. Yes. Good morning, Ms. Romila. I'm Shrikal Pandey from class 11. And my question to you is how has the cultural shift affected your growth? Cultural shift, okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, it's definitely been there, uh, I would say. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, I miss I miss Bollywood songs. <laughs> I miss being able to speak in my native language. But apart from that, there's a huge community of Indians here because most of the people move here for work and uh, um, and you know you find you make friends. So I have friends from across the world now. I know people from Italy. I know people from France. So I couldn't have gotten that kind of exposure if I was in India. So uh, initially it feels like too much, but then eventually it feels like you always, uh, you know, you've been here for some time. In that sense, US is very accommodating, I would say, because there's a lot of, like a lot of people come from across the world. Like my boss, uh, she's, uh, she's from Italy and, you know, one of my coworkers, uh, most of my coworkers are from Iran, some are from India. So it kind of, you kind of get in the groove of it. So initially, I think the one thing that I miss is be having to cook and clean all by myself. <laughs> um, that was not so much of a pain when I was in India, but yes, you have to actually be, uh, you know, a doer and you have to take care of everything, your work, your own life, your, your personal, you have to talk back home because your mom and dad are like, oh, what's happening? Why are you not giving us a call and anything? So... But apart from that, it's it's a land of opportunities, I would say, and I would highly recommend if, if you want to factor that in in your life at some point, everybody should come and work outside India. It's it's very different, you know. 
uh, people respect your uh, personal time, people, uh, yeah, so, and there is a huge, huge uh, focus on mental health, and uh, which is something that I found different, when, because I worked in India for the first three years, and then I moved here, so, so that's, that's, you know, different, so it's both good and bad, and then you start uh, eating different kinds of food, I, I don't get a lot of Indian food here, so I eat different cuisines, so that's, that's fun too, <laughs> but yeah. I don't know what else can I say. That's nice. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Women, women in science, a force in power, achievements that no one can count. Their work is strong, their minds are bright. Achieving more than what's inside. From the lab to the classroom, they bring a unique sense of wisdom. Their inside is sharp. Their ideas are new. Their contributions are something to be. From inventors to physicists, their work is something that exists. Their research and discoveries are something to see. Women in science doing wonders for all, a force that can never be small. With this, now let's hear from Ms. Deha Tiwari, her take on her scientific experiences and alumnus of Ariman Vikram Birla Institute of Learning, currently working as a research scholar in the field of chemistry in Hong Kong. Now it's over to you, Ms. Neha. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Not? Oh, you can, you can. Okay, okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I'll start. My name is Nakhwati. Uh, uh, and uh, I can see ma'am. So that's the last one as well. Um, so, uh, You guys can actually hear me. I think you can. I can't hear anyway. You guys can tell me if you can't hear me. We can't hear you. Uh, Is it better now? <laughs> I just changed. Okay. 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 So I'll start again. Hello, people. Um, my name is Neha Tiwari. I'm a 2012 batch, PCM Section C. Uh, and I can see Maji Sayur, as I said. He was our class teacher. So a little bit about what I did. I After I graduated, I did my bachelor's and my master's from uh, University of Delhi, where I graduated with uh, physical chemistry as my field. Uh, Fast forward, I went for a PhD to Hong Kong, where I last year graduated with a PhD in chemistry. Uh, so my work there was mainly related to batteries, uh, lithium-ion batteries. I know uh, all of you know a little bit about batteries. I think I'll actually have two mini slides. So batteries in general, even if you do not know, you have batteries in your laptop, you have batteries in your phone. Uh, so that's a little bit that I worked on. I graduated last year, came home for a two-month vacation, and I'm here on my first job right now. Uh, so let me tell you what I did. A little bit of it, I think. Uh, Are you trying to figure out the Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you see this though? Right, it it <laughs> you can see it, right? Yeah, I can yeah, see. Yeah, because I can't see you guys right now. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. So just to give you a brief about it, right? We all know what are batteries. You know what are batteries. Batteries are basically the the energy storing device in your phones and in your laptops. Uh, so nowadays, you know, it's just we use lithium ion batteries, which are the most common used ones. What happens is the movement of lithium ions current is generated, and that is what you use to work out anything. Uh, so there's one project that we worked on, which I think you might find interesting. which was use of solar batteries right so we have a lot of ample amounts of sunlight everywhere and it's sustainable it's renewable so using it can actually benefit us uh, so we tried making solar batteries with it now this is solar panels and batteries you must have seen a lot of solar panels in india hamari chhaton pe hote hain bahut sare right so uh, these solar panels what do they do they just absorb your sunlight now maybe you want to use it then then it's good well and good if you do not want to use it then then you have some batteries attached so that you can save that energy for later but this system is really complex you know it's a lot of added weight it's a lot of added cost you need to see the compatibility of the two devices so there's a lot happening there and maybe you don't like it maybe it's expensive maybe it's not uh, sufficient for you uh, so there is a alternative way, which is one device battery i'm still hoping you guys can hear me and see me um so this is a solar battery which is you know there are these available and luckily my lab was working on those materials uh, so these materials are bifunctional they can work in a solar cell in a solar cell and they can work in a battery so they can help you absorb energy and they can help you store it so why not use those materials to make this one device system that can work as both the things together you know solar batteries uh, so that is it's not our invention that is something that is being researched on but we played a part in it um so this was our work basically okay that's a normal battery in haldwani me you can find it anywhere it's a coin cell battery because it's of the size of a coin and because our material was inside it and we wanted to make solar batteries we punched that battery you know with a hole sealed it with glass and then put it under some light source so we thought that let's not plug it onto the wall as we plug our phones let's just charge it by light and that's how we made our photo battery which we also call as a solar battery uh so this was our system and we actually charged it with that camp and we tried to see if it actually can be used and it could actually be used so we used it to charge a hygrometer which you can see here you can see the humidity and you can see the uh, humidity and the temperature there it's 24 degrees celsius then we used it also to see you know a red led um, like we could charge it well um, and then we also got some uh, recognition for it because it was a noble work in the field of our material um and the funny thing about the story i cannot see you guys i think you can see me so the funny thing about the story is we clicked 10 pictures that day it was covid times in hong kong they were very extreme with the measures so there was just one picture with the mask and nine without the masks but every media journal that took this took this picture so i hope you believe that it's me <laughs> and i have not just forged my picture into it um yeah so that was our work with this and uh, after that right now then i took you know we did some more work with the electrodes and the batteries but i think this was something you would be interested in so i showed you this these are known as photo rechargeable batteries and uh, so currently i am in a new job where uh, we work on it is an industrial post doctoral fellow because it's after my doctorate so it's called a post doc and so here i have to work on the research and development of already established batteries so there are some companies they give us their batteries and they want us to find some faults so there is and goes known as faulty cells they want us to find some faults with their batteries I'm very new to it, so I'm not sure how we're going to propagate that field. But um, I think it's interesting. I'm going to learn and uh, hopefully do something good with it. Um, so yeah, this field is amazing. I think energy storage is a uh, it has a bright future, even in India for that matter. You see, India wants to go electric, right, with vehicles. So electric vehicles they need electricity. For electricity, you need batteries. So you talk about Bangalore, you talk about Pune, you talk about Hyderabad. There is a battery electric vehicle startup happening everywhere in India. and even some well known brands for example ola ola has a research r and d team for ola electric for uh, batteries now because they want to get into this field um so yeah i think i'm just glad to be a small part in this field and glad to understand what's happening and i'm very happy to be here um i can see akhilesh sir i can see aarti ma'am uh, maji sir so it's amazing that like uh, you know even if you get this little validation from your school where you've studied it feels so good so i think all of us are very happy to be here and uh, there's so much that i've learned from all of them i mean school has taught you so much uh, you know personality development even the students you meet the teachers have been so supportive uh, so i'm very glad to be here and thank you for inviting me and yes all your questions are welcome
It was wonderful knowing about your experience, ma'am. I have a question from you. It often happens that while working, because the days are not same, we feel unmotivated on certain days. So how do you manage to keep motivated even on the days that don't feel rewarding? Hmm. Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, as Romila talked about self-discipline, you know, I don't think I, I'm no one to preach about self-discipline. I'm, I'm really trying to practice it. But uh, just setting some deadlines for yourself and knowing why you started in the first place, you know, because days are going to be tough. There are going to be days where you're going to feel very unmotivated. Uh, so one thing that you can do is not try to burn out. Don't overwork yourself. You know, have some weekend, have a day off, guilt-free day off, you know, spend time with your hobbies. For me, uh, as Romela said, you know, I came to Hong Kong and I realized there's a big hike culture here. So I, I, start, I started hiking and I enjoyed it a lot. So, you know, going on hikes with my friends, uh, you know, weekly catch-ups with friends, that helps to, that prevents your burnout. You want, we are social animals. Humans want some social interactions. So apart from work, you know, have friends outside work. Uh, I like to dance, so I started dancing here after many years. You know, I took it as a hobby, and I tried to learn dancing. Uh, and then after that, then you set up a timetable for yourself. You try to work it out. You have any doubts? You go to your supervisor for help, uh, and just try to be self-disciplined. You have to know why you started in the first place. And you know, just I think it's it's very inner that that thing needs to come from the inner self. But take a well-deserved break if you don't feel like at all. Take a one-day, two-day break, and then start from scratch again. That's what I would say. That works for me. Thank you for your valuable words, ma'am. I hope we all will be able to implement in, in our daily lives. After Ms. So Neha, after Ms. Neha, we have Dr. Sukriti Tripathi with us, who is pursuing MBA in ENT from Chandigarh University. Now it's over to you, Ms. Sukriti. Good morning, everyone. Hi. It's so nice to see everybody. It's been, I think, eight years since, uh, you know, we left school. But it seems, it, it feels like right now, seeing that uniform, oh my God, it brings back so many memories. So many students with those red coats, it, bring back, it brings back so many memories. Well, um, hi, guys. How are you all? How are you doing today? Well, so just letting you know what I do for a living right now. Well, basically, I'm a junior resident in a government multi-speciality hospital in Chandigarh. I'm pursuing my uh, DNB degree in otorhinolaryngology. Two heavy words, but yeah, it's basically I'm an ET surgeon, you're known for specialist. So anybody, if you have a problem with that, please feel free to contact for everybody right now uh, also I am an allergy specialist allergic rhinitis anybody all of you people who have moved off moved off to you know far off countries please feel, feel free to contact me well um, just kidding so basically what I want to tell you I'm from Romila's batch and oh my god Romila it's so nice to see you right now and I'm really sorry guys I could not uh, prepare a presentation or anything I was on a shift but just uh, I would just like to talk to you guys basically all i can show you right now is this pocket thing which i have which i carry always me this is basically an otoscope and since it's all about science you know infecting your job and life right now this thing is basically my bread and butter for life i feel this small little device is something i use every day for around 10 to 15 hours a day this is some this device helps me you know uh, see patients and everything and uh, uh, basic a small little device and since I am a microsurgeon basically I, I am performing not larger surgeries but very small specific surgeries on you know very specific body parts which is uh, ear, nose, throat and head and neck so it these small little equipments because basically since it's a microsurgical field we have to visualize what is happening it's not like you can open up a body part and just see what is there we have a lot of cameras which we use a lot of endoscopes which we use so basically science and this my field goes hand in hand and I have been a part of a lot of institutions because I did my 
UG from GMC, Dhule in Maharashtra. Then I was working as a medical officer. And then I have, you know, joined my post-graduation. But, you know, school always holds a very special part in your life. Oh my God, Aarti Ma'am is joining. When she approached me for this, I was like, oh my God, 8.30 in the morning. Won't be able to work it out. But then I was like, nahi yaar, this I have to do. I have to see everybody in the house, school going on and everything. It was, and literally this feels surreal. It's very amazing. And uh, I think the best part about our school was that they taught, you know, the whole culture of the school was so great. Everybody, all the teachers were so supportive because as a doctor, I have to make decisions about life and death. I've seen very harsh realities of life and, you know, decision making is very important in my field. Uh, in every field I would say but in my field it's just little seconds can you know change a person's life and their you know uh, other things as well so basically that decision making I feel that part of personality which developed was you did not teach me that much PG did not teach me that much but school interactions school things what we used to do every day uh, you know our teachers used to say that make a timetable make a timetable I have a pocket notebook and I have like you know to-do lists every day I keep on updating those to-do lists and that is like something which I have been doing since school and that has helped me somehow in, in you know actually maintaining a balance between a lot of work because there are a lot of things which we have to remember as doctors because you can't just you know uh, rely on everything uh, on technology or just a presentation or anything I have to remember certain things in my mind and that that to do notebook is something which I have learned from school and that has been a part of my life since then also I would like to say that uh, you know school friends school friends is something which is very 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 important and there have I have made friends in school I mean I, I think everybody would agree that after school that bond that spe special thing that which comes with there's five six friends from school which will still stay with you and everything and they will be a part of your life for life so that is something which is like really close to my heart from school and one thing I would tell like to tell you kids is be true to yourself and if you're true to yourself it's it'll be just like you're enjoying your work and if you're enjoying your work like I you know I crave about my work about my seniors I crave about juniors I'm like I'm really tired all the time but the best part is I actually really enjoy my work and that is why this you know this life which I'm living right now is something I have ever always imagined for myself and I am so glad that you gave me this opportunity to just share my little experiences with you all. Thank you so much. And I would uh, like to, you know, address any of your questions if you have them. It was wonderful knowing about the experience, ma'am. We are glad to know that you are doing fine. This school, we have come to know that you were a very fun-loving person in school. Can you please give us some advice? And what are the things one should avoid while being in school? <laughs> Oh my god, that is a very appropriate question to ask me, I feel. Uh, well, I was a very fun-loving person in school. I still am a very fun-loving person. But yeah, that what I said. Self-discipline, 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 hard work over intelligence any day. Any day, hard work over intelligence. You know, I think a lot of, a, a very important thing I would like to address right now is in most of the schools, it's like, and I have seen this thing happening in, you know, with my friends, with my colleagues, that everybody appreciates an intelligent person and they're like, oh my God, you're so intelligent. And there is, there is, I think no more people are there who have, you know, intelligent, unsuccessful people. There are so many of them and that leads to a lot of frustration and, you know, uh, frustration, anxiety, tensions. What I would like to say is, you have to work hard. Like three weekends out of four weekends, I am working. But the one weekend I am not fun in fun like anything. I would like dance like crazy, go on you know trips and everything, everything. That reach of your recharging is very important because I am in a particular situation. I have to see 
for the zeal and everything, everything. I have to deal with a lot of patients. Everybody, you know, complaining about something or the other. But then, you know, that recharging is very important. And yes, fun, fun is a very important part of my life. I am still the, you know, the easy go lucky chap. You know, I used to be in school. I still am that person. But yes, that has to be, you know. That, that that has to be given a certain time and your work your studies your career has to become a priority at times and you have to you know just divide your time accordingly you just have to make sure that you give your time to everything in your life be it your personal life be it your parents be it your work be it your career it has to be a scheduled table which as i told you that notebook is still in my hand and that is how i like, you know control what is going on in my life um uh, hi guys anything else thank you for your insightful message miss thank you it was really amazing hearing you now over thank to the we can have got some questions to ask good morning ma'am i'm harshita joshi and a student of class 11 i'm in hello and my question to you is what is your magic mantra for a successful career thank you okay magic mantra look i feel there is no magic mantra all these big words are just you know fads which have been set about by people that this do this and do this it's you know anything you do in life has to be tailor made according to your personality it has to be tailor made according to your own interest it has to be tailor made according to your talent and as i have already said hard work over intelligence you have to work hard you have to put in those efforts you cannot be like oh i'll study for only one night and i'll pass and i'll i'll be successful and it has to be consistency 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 you have to be consistent with your work like to to this day two hours of my day i have to spend on what i am learning how am i learning what new thing am i learning because you know it's very easy to get into the monotony of life and just you know just be there be still you do not you cannot do that you always have to strive for learning new things that is very important i feel according to me and if you could call it a magic mantra i think striving to learn new things is my magic mantra for life thank you thank you ma'am thank you You can do anything you put your mind to. One such example among us is Ms. Vidushi Pandey, who had got laurels as a topper in board examination. After completing her post graduation in environmental science, she is now working for her passion. She is currently a part of WWL as a research consultant. Over to you, ma'am. We are more than ready to hear your success story. Uh, well, thank you so much. That was a very uh, generous introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vidushi Pant. I'm an alumna of the third and third batch of uh, AVBIL, and uh, that is one year senior to uh, Sukriti and uh, Ramila. Uh, and I graduated in 2012. Um, so it's almost been uh, more than uh, a decade that I've we all of us have donned those checkered skirts and roamed around in the school. So it's absolute pleasure to be here today. thank you so much for the management and teachers and all of the students um to organize this uh, very interesting um discussion on women in uh, science so um and uh, i'll quickly take you through my academic and professional uh, uh, journey and um, so i'm academically trained in natural sciences i um i i have a masters in environmental studies and a bachelor's in life sciences which kind of makes me um which acquainted me to the natural environment around me and um, so i'm currently working as a, a research consultant with wwf i don't know if you've heard of it it's an organization that works in the field of wildlife um you might have seen its logo it's a panda i will just share my screen and um, quickly take you through the organizations that i worked with and what kind of work i do um just let me know once my screen is visible to you
Yes, ma'am. This was visible. Thank you so much for confirming. Um, so these are just some of the organizations that I've previously worked with. This here is WWF that I currently am uh, associated with. Um, so my work at WWF um, involves around understanding wildlife corridors of India, and we are trying to profile the corridors. Now, it, it might seem a little daunting as to what profiling and what wildlife corridors actually mean. So I'm just going to quickly, very basically, tell you what it um, stands for and what it implies. Um, so we, we all know that there are um, tiger reserves, there are national parks, wildlife sanctuaries. A lot of you might have also visited them. Um, come to think of it, we live uh, about 50 kilometers away from uh, the first national park that was set in India, um, which was Corbett National Park. So living 50 kilometers away from uh, a protected area kind of gives you an insight that you might not even realize that you have right now. So, um, so these protected areas are spread across the country, and you have more than 900 protected areas in India itself. Um, but there are animals that can't survive in these small areas. For example, tigers and sloth bears and uh, elephants, rhinos, these are wide ranging species. Uh, you can't contain them within protected areas. Of course, protected areas have done a fabulous job in protecting wildlife and uh, bringing India to its current status of uh, a green country. But um, these animals, they look for, they, they need to move kilometers, you know. Um, one, there's, I, I don't know if you've uh, heard that news, but in 2019, there was a tiger that moved approximately 1,300 kilometers from one uh, place to the other. And uh, so for that kind of movement, you need corridors. These are nothing but um, habitat patches which animals use to move from one area to other. But they are very important in maintaining uh, the status of wildlife in India. So if you look at these two, this this patch here, right here, of course, this is just a descriptive uh, uh, illustration, but it's, it could be forests, it could be agricultural lands, anything. So it's, it's important to kind of understand where these corridors are, because they're not legally protected, right? You don't uh, in India, we don't have a legal protection for corridors. So that's where we come in. We try to plug in that information. Um, so as, as a research consultant, my job is to visit these corridors and ask pertaining questions about them. Um, so, you know, how many corridors are there in India and which species are found there? Um, what, why can't they move freely if they're not able to move uh, freely? And, you know, where exactly should we set up a mining site? Where should the construction be set up? So these are some, some changes, um, some questions that we ask. And uh, while these questions might seem um, non-scientific in nature or very raw and crude, but we um, you'll be surprised to know that we actually do end up using a lot of sophisticated scientific techniques and tools to kind of answer these questions. So we have GIS analysis, we have a GIS team who's working um, and using satellite data to figure out where the corridors are, which corridors can be used. Um, we have another team that uses DNA sampling so we go to the field, we go to these jungles and forests and collect um, DNA samples, come back to our labs, analyze them, and, you know, kind of set which population is set where, which is what, what are the threats they are facing genetically. So these are just some of the questions that come up in my journey as a, a wildlife researcher, and we try to answer them um, based on the tools that are available to us. So um, I'll quickly take you through some pictures that... Um, show what my office looks like. Uh, my everyday life is um, very different from uh, any other day that I've lived. So I don't know what, what, what the next day is going to bring for me. And these are just some photographs of what's the National Park in Ladakh. Um, this, is, this is actually very close to home. This is uh, Corbett. Then you have these Munnar. Um, this is a corridor down south in Western Ghats. Um, these are just some of my colleagues that I work with and work for. These are sloth bears. Um, again, just some. Yeah, so um, this was quickly what I work with. Uh, I think uh, um, school has given me a lot of um, understanding of what science means. Um, we've gone, I mean, just being there, those discussions, the classes, uh, being able to participate in a lot of competitions was something that uh, opened up your mind to, um, to see what sort of um, what science holds for you as uh, students, and then finally, as uh, when you start working in that field. 
So um, I'm grateful to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having um, uh, having me here. And I, I wanted to quickly end with this because um, this is something that I wanted to uh, leave with. Um, so research is nothing but uh, but just formalizing your curiosity. We all are curious about things. Um, so, so Neha is curious about, say, uh, batteries and how, how energy works. Then um, Romila is curious about how data works and how she can make sense of that data. Um, you know, Sukriti would be working, would be interested in how, in, in being curious about how body works. I'm curious in understanding what's the behavior of wildlife um, and how, how animals work, what we can do, what, how we can use that to inform policy decisions. So in, in, if you really have to distill all of it, it's going to be just one word, and that's formalized curiosity. Just be curious, but ensure, as again, Sukriti mentioned, um, be consistent with that curiosity. Poke and pry, but do it with a purpose so that at the end, you know, um, there's something quickly, um, a very minor glimpse into what life is like as a wildlife researcher. I hope um, I would see a lot of you uh, in science in the coming years. Thank you so much. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, one tiny thing, if you are interested in the field, you think you have questions about what wildlife is like, I'll quickly drop in my email and you can please feel free to reach out. And I'd be happy to assist you in however way I can. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. That was really interesting and informative. Listening to your story, there is a question that popped up in my head. Being a woman, how challenging is your job? Um. Yeah. So especially when uh, I am in a team, it's going to be difficult because a lot of time you won't have network. Uh, a lot of time you don't know where you're going. A lot of time you won't have a, you can't have a set timetable that you're going to be back from field in two days. Um, you have to stay at local uh, places. You have to deal with, uh, you know, you have to go and actually explore things that are unexplored. If you're in a forest, you have to get up at four in the morning and go and be in the field by five and, you know, stay there for two hours and get your data. You might not have internet connection there. So you have to use um, your experience and what you know about uh, the field to make sense of um, uh, your actions. So that's, that's very um, challenging. That was very challenging initially, but I think now I've found my way around it. And um, so that is one. The second thing, uh, again, you know, there are minor things like you, language can be a barrier for you because you're working um, in deep pockets of forests and working with local communities. So that's something that you struggle with initially and then find your way around it. Um, but overall, even if it, though it's challenging, it is absolutely rewarding. Um, hi, hi, you're on mute. Can you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. You're making a positive impact on all of us. After Ms. Vidushi, we have Ms. Harshita Das, well known for her calm and composed behavior at school. She is MBBS doctor and is working at Government Hospital, so you are writing a note. Over to you, ma'am. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here, seeing my seniors. Neeti is here, my batchmate, and all the teachers. And even all of you wearing the school uniform, it brings a lot of brings up a lot of nostalgic feelings. And so about myself, I'm Harshita Das from Bash 2014. Uh, I graduated from GMC Hazani with my MBBS. And I'm currently working as a medical officer at CHC Suyalbari, it's near Almora. Um, my job comprises of uh, looking after patients in OPD, IPD, emergencies. And uh, I also try to uh, uh, do some research along with my, that. Um, school played a very important part in developing my uh, personality and the kind of person I, I am right now. Uh, mainly it was the nurturing environment of the teachers and uh, the competition provided by my peers and also the support. Uh, there were events and activities that uh, helped building confidence in myself and to help myself put out, uh, put myself out there. Um, currently, it's uh, 
these things have helped me quite a lot in my job because uh, knowledge is uh, knowledge is important uh, um, in being a doctor but also uh, you need to have confidence in yourself and social skills to calm down an agitated patient or to reassure a scared one so yeah, school has helped me a lot in these uh, i also mentioned mentioned the research uh, i have tried to involve myself in research since medical school there was one in internship i participated in the effect of um, 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 stone stone workers um, how the, their health is affected in regards to their lung capacities and uh, hearing now i am working on a quality improvement project and a clinical audit on the treatment of hypertension locally at my hospital as well as uh, i'm researching the impact of breastfeeding in newborn children uh, these things bring a uh, spice to the daily routine which is uh, look, uh, looking at patients daily uh, also i was asked to tell about the challenges in my jobs um, the main challenge i have experienced is that you cannot save everyone um, there are many patients that i have lost not too much thankfully but uh, they impacted a quite impacted quite a lot on my mental health and um, i've learned along the way that uh, you cannot save everyone and i have to understand that i did everything that i could and um, some activities during my off time also help take off some of the pressure like uh, my normal activities like painting i'm not good at painting but uh it helps um also um in regards to giving advice to juniors <laughs> i would like to tell you to work smarter not harder because um there's a lot of things you have to learn especially in mbbs you cannot learn everything you have to take a targeted approach like uh, research the exam you want to crack and uh, work specifically on that and not just start mucking up everything you come across so that's it for right now i'm sorry i could not make a presentation uh, i would be i would be happy to take any questions you have thank you ma'am your words of wisdom has enlightened us all my question to you is what were your feelings and emotions when you examined your very first patient uh examining my first patient happened during my clinical posting in mbbs so it was not that overwhelming at that time because uh, we were under the guidance of our seniors and um, teachers but uh, after my internship the first patient was quite overwhelming i did not have the any guidance i had to handle the patient on my own and it was a delivery patient and <laughs> i was uh, i was not that good at deliveries at that time but thankfully that everything went well uh, after that i um, re revised everything that i could about deliveries and that happens with every patient that something if i come across something new i revise uh, about that disease or that symptom again so i will be better prepared for that kind of patient next time Over to the audience. Any questions? Good morning, ma'am. Uh, I hope you have a good day of class eleven. And my question to you is, how do you cope with the stress uh, while studying or at work? Um, thankfully, I don't have very long working hours right now. Um, because I'm not doing my PG, I'm just a medical officer. So working hours are not that stressful compared to doing a PG. so i i'm able to uh, manage my time and get enough time to study uh, there's also the fact that i'm currently living in the periphery so do, i don't have much else to do other than study here so it's not that stressful i enjoy studying sorry i could not help you with that one thank you ma'am over to the audience
Last but not the least, we have Ms. Niti Joshi. Last, last but not the least, last but not the least, we have Ms. Niti Joshi who deals with the emotional and mental well-being of people. She is a clinical psychologist and is currently working with the Emotional Wellness Initiative for now. Ms. Neeti, the stage is all yours. We'd be more than honored to hear about your story from school to working in the field of psychology. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you guys can hear me. Apologies for not being able to make a PPT. Uh, work was a lot. I couldn't get some time. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you know my name already. Uh, like you said, I am a clinical psychologist. I work with adults uh, mostly, sometimes with adolescents. Uh, I help them with their mental and emotional well-being. I am a specialist in depression, anxiety, PTSD, and ADHD. Uh, I work with a lot of uh, survivors of abuse. So job is stressful, yes. It can get to you sometimes. But I absolutely love what I do. Uh, I have been trained in multiple therapies. I am trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. Other than that, I am a trauma-informed uh, specialist, which means I know a bunch of trauma therapies. Uh, I'm currently uh, learning in this clinic in Gurgaon. I am learning to do TMS, which is something we call transcranial uh, muscle stimulation where there are uh, patients with depression and anxiety and OCD and other uh, mental illnesses who are treatment resistant. So in a way, therapy and medications don't really work for them and life does get uh, very hard for them. So uh, research kind of, I love research. So <laughs> research kind of uh, found out this new method that is called TMS, where we can stimulate their transcranial muscles here, right? Put a bunch of stuff and do a little bit of techie thingies, which I'm learning right now. <laughs> Not very good at it, but trying my best. And uh, that has seen good results with treatment resistant uh, mental illnesses. So that's what I'm doing currently. Uh, other than that, I train and teach. So I train a lot of young mental health professionals. When I say young, younger than me, I just turned 26 like seven days ago and it's scary. <laughs> But yeah, uh, training and teaching is something I've always loved. Uh, this brings me to back to school, you know, uh, so many teachers and such huge impact they all had on us. Um, I could see Maji sir here. He was my class teacher. I I'm from the batch of 2014. I was Harshita's classmate. Uh, I always adored teachers and the patience they had with us. Oh, God, that is a lot. And I do that almost uh, three days a week now, teach, teach and train. And it takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of, uh, I think, uh, rigor to come and address a huge class filled with curious minds, filled with people who want to learn a lot, but might also sometimes not know how to learn, not know what will help them. And as a teacher, as a trainer, you don't just teach them what's in the book, you teach them about life, right? And I think that's what our teachers did. Uh, I had a difficult time in school uh, when I was in 12th and my class teacher, Maji sir, was very helpful. Uh, he has an impact. I think about him quite often. When I have to help out uh, kids with their uh, difficulties in school or, you know, then when they come up with relationship issues to me, when they come up with, oh, you know, I had a breakup and I can't focus on studies. And I'm like, yeah, have I? <laughs> so that's life uh, right now. Uh, I work uh, with patients six hours a day almost, have like six calls where I give therapy, uh, hear a lot of bunch of stuff, try and support and care for them as much as I can. Uh, also try and take care of myself. Other time, I try to learn. I try to teach. Uh, what else I do? I'm a dancer. I'm a trained Kathak dancer. So sometimes I try to take out time for that. And yeah, I would agree with what Romila said. 
prediction and prevention. I love that. Uh, that's what I also try to do through research, predict uh, when something's going to help and prevent when I can. Uh, prevention is, preventive measures are definitely better than curative measures almost always. So please seek right help whenever needed uh, with friends, with parents, with teachers, if needed with a mental health professional. Uh, there can be a lot of people that can guide you and support you. And it's very important to take help because uh, a lot of people will tell you it makes you weak to kind of go around and ask for help. I think it makes you very strong because it takes a lot of courage to go, go and say, dude, I'm vulnerable. Dude, I need you. I need a hug. Right. And I think that's what we all want. I mean, we all want hugs, at least one hug a day. Right. So please ask for it. And uh we're all here talking about women in science and tech and everything. And I think uh, there's not one day we can wake up without tech. I mean, one day my alarm doesn't ring, my day goes to, it just doesn't work out, right? And how has tech helped me? I think in my career, especially uh, today, I can sit in Gurgaon or I can sit in Hazwani and I can work with clients who live in Germany, US, UK. I never thought as a therapist, I'll be able to do that because therapy only looked like, you know, sitting on a couch with a patient in a closed room and talking about a bunch of stuff. Now it's much more than that. You can, I was sitting in Hazwani a few uh, days ago, uh, celebrated my birthday and immediately logged on to work with a client from Germany. And it was amazing. I just thought uh, when I was 17, 18, I never thought this is how my life will turn out. Now that I look back, I am glad the 17-year-old me made this decision, took psychology and did what I'm doing right now. A little bit about my qualification. I did my bachelor's and my master's in applied psychology. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, human behavior, mental illnesses, research and a lot of other things. Other than that, after that, I started working with a startup where I was working with special needs kids who struggled with autism, ADHD, and other mental illnesses. Post that, I did my MPhil under the Rehabilitation Council of India, which makes me a licensed clinical psychologist. Right now, I work online with a lot of clients, uh, adults mostly, uh, somewhere around the range of 19 years to 60 years. My oldest client is 60. Uh, sometimes work with adolescents and uh, working with adolescents again reminds me about, about school, difficulties we had there and the fun we had there. So that's that. Uh, I think I'll tell you one thing about uh, stress per se, right? A little bit of stress is good for all of us, right? Uh, we all talk about stress and anxiety in such negative light. It's not always bad. It's good sometimes, but only a little amount, right? Because it motivates us. It gets our uh, hormones, our neurotransmitter working. And it, you know, a little bit of anxiety motivates you to make a to-do list, which gets your day starting, right? So... When we talk about stress, uh, maybe a little technical, but there is eustress and then there is distress, right? Eustress is good for us. It motivates us. Distress is not so good for us. And when we feel distressed, that's the time to seek help, use your coping skills, uh, learn distress tolerance. That's a new word for all of you. Google what it means. See if you can learn it online. If not, um, start developing skills or your own coping mechanisms that can help you tolerate distress. Um, yeah, that is from my side. I will not take a lot of time. It's early in the morning. I have a lot of calls. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I will take all your questions. I love questions. So yeah, over to you guys. Ask me anything. Thank you um, for your valuable insights. Now moving forward with some questions. Ma'am, can you brief us about the role of social media on one's mental health? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I think social media has both good and bad effects, right? Uh, today, social media is not just entertainment. It is uh, both a combination of education and entertainment. It teaches you a lot of things. It makes you aware. You can go on Instagram and 
follow a bunch of therapists, you will know a lot about mental health. I do that myself uh, on Instagram, you know, uh, people reach out to me for therapy there. So that is there. But also there are a lot of negative effects because uh, the amount of time you spend there is what we call screen time in general, right? And that means you're just st- sitting down and not really doing something that is stimulating, right? And as much time you will sit, spend sit down without doing anything stimulating will always, almost always have negative effects on your mental health. Also, uh, social media is a tricky place, right? Uh, you're not always sure how safe you are out there, right? So uh, a lot of things I see in my work with a lot of young adults, especially, is feeling unsafe on social media, uh, getting bullied, getting um, tracked by people, getting stalked, um, getting abused sometimes, sadly. So that definitely is scary. And uh, I think one piece of advice from my side would be, Use social media, enjoy the fun, look at TikToks, look at Reels, have your own fun, but make sure you spend only some amount of your time there, right? And it doesn't become most part of your day. At the same time, make sure you're keeping yourself safe. Make sure you're not using your passwords, uh, you're not telling it to other people. When you upload your pictures, make sure it is what you want to put online and you're not doing it because of peer pressure or because of what other people are doing online. Uh, I think I would say be yourself online. That's just the right recipe of being online, right? Because uh, I feel that we all feel the pressure of wanting to portray the right, the best and the amazing kind of image online. But life is not that easy, right? Life is not all colors, right? Uh, it is sometimes black and it is sometimes gray and it is sometimes sad and it is okay to let people know that, right? So uh, while social media has both positive and negative effects, take on the positive, try and avoid the negatives. If ever the negatives happen, reach out for help. Tell your parents, tell your teachers, tell your seniors, tell your friends. Uh, There are a lot of people who can help you out if social media ever gets to you, right? Deactivate your account for a week. Come back again, right? That is always an option. So do that. I hope this answers the question. If there's anything else. Thank you, ma'am. That is one of the answers. As for the audience, any questions that you might have are welcome. Good morning, ma'am. I am Nina Vish of Class Level. Uh, so what is your advice for the young people who are pursuing career Hmm, that's a great question. I think uh, that's what I do at least one hour a day is advise younger people in the profession. I think my advice would be uh, before you can help somebody else, help yourself. Because if you enter the field with the thought of I will heal my own traumas by healing others, won't work. You will reflect, you will project, you can make things worse. It is, psychology sounds all fun and games. It is interesting. It is, I swear. But it is a very uh, critical career. It is a very critical profession. It demands a lot of emotional strength. And while people can tell you all about how to study, how to prepare for exams, you do that in school too, you'll do that in college, you'll do that all your life. Uh, That's not enough right? Uh, My advice would be to anybody and everybody in any field, uh, build distress tolerance, build emotion regulation skills, because uh, our emotions make us who we are, right? All emotions are welcomed. Anger is not bad. Anxiety is not bad, right? We just need to learn how to cope with it. In psychology, as a therapist, as a psychiatrist, as a psychologist, it's always difficult to sit across the table with somebody who comes to you with so much faith and trust that you can help them heal from abuse, from pain, from uh, trust issues, from relationship issues, right? Make sure that you're healing them and they're not a mirror for you, rather you are a mirror for them, right? You help them see themselves the way they want to see themselves. You don't project, you don't deflect. Uh, 
seek help before you want to give help practice what you preach i am a preacher of self care and i think uh, we need to practice that before we preach it out there so anybody who ever wishes to join psychology do it uh, love the subject you will fall in love with the subject i promise you that but to fall in love with the profession i think you will have to work on yourself a little bit so that you can then work with other people and make an impact so not a very rosy advice but i hope it helps thank you ma'am you're welcome To end today's journey of inspiration and empowerment, we have our last panelist, Ms. Akshita Sethi, who is a veterinary doctor in Alora. The video will be played. So also पर्सन this profession but with the help of my teachers i did it and now to be here you know uh jaipi is a very interior village in uh, district azura here people are devoid of basic medical facilities i try my best to provide them with these i try my best to uh, reduce uh, home deliveries which in turn will decrease the maternal mortality rate which is death of the mother and infant mortality rate my job is a very stressful job indeed it is i try to cope up this with the help of my family my friends i listen to music i listen i dance uh science ha- has a very important role in my field uh there are very like various like toxic techniques various treatment techniques nowadays robotic surgery is in demand uh science has been developed of various new drugs uh advice which i would like to give you all uh is that uh, focusing on career is important and enjoying life is important as well so there should be a balance between things all of us if you want to change the future start living as if you are already To conclude the program, we would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our honorable chairperson, Madam Manjushri Khatan, for providing us a platform where we all bloom out with flying colors. We are grateful and highly thankful to our alumni, panelists of the event, the teachers and students of Ashok World Group of Schools, and invite the guests for sparing their valuable time to witness the program. We also thank the teachers and students for their enthusiastic participation and their contribution in making this program a great success. Big thank you to one and all for gracing this occasion. Thank you. I think I would like to take a moment here uh, before you guys drop off. It, I don't know how much of a learning it has been for you guys, but for me it has been a huge learning. I mean, watching all of you doing incredible stuff in your careers, uh, and it's 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 been so much. I mean, we have somebody from wildlife, we have battery specialists, we have doctors, psychologists, 
uh, it's it's incredible. And uh, one thing that I want to say is, I know this was about, and I see it was about women in STEM, uh, you know, science, tech, engineering, maths. Uh, and I know one of you posed a question of how difficult it is to navigate it as a woman. Uh, so um, what I want to tell you is it's going to be challenging, but if you keep your head straight and you try to find the right people, if you do not lose uh, faith in yourself, you can actually make it. And I think the incredible people in this panel are a great example. Uh, if you move like one generation ago, we didn't have as many women and as much representation. So I definitely think that things are changing. That's that's what I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to more women doing maths and science and just, you know, doing great stuff. So I take that question with a pinch of salt. It kind of hurts when people ask you, oh, how difficult it is as a woman, because no man would get asked that question. Uh, you know, how difficult it is as a man to be whatever. But I know where that question is coming from. I know where, what is the, uh, you know, uh, element that you're looking to address. But I want to live in a world, utopian world, where we would not be asking this question, how does it feel like to be with a woman in science? Uh, so, because I think, uh, and I think most women right now would resonate with that feeling because if I'm being very honest with you, Rupinder Kaur Bajwa, she was my science teacher. Maya Mehra, Soni Pandey, uh, you know, Meena Ma'am. I mean, all of these uh, incredible teachers, there were definitely male teachers as well, but this is about women in STEM. So I want to say that, you know, most of my science learning has actually come from women. Vanita Arora Ma'am, she didn't teach me but we had like biology teachers, we had science teachers, math teachers. So women have been in science way before it was cool. It's now that we've started, you know, making an impact and making ourselves, putting ourselves out there and uh, trying to take space, trying to be vocal about it. So look around you. You have so many incredible examples of uh, women in tech, you know. Uh, yeah, so a huge thank you to all my teachers and uh, I, I am so ever so grateful and you know you realize this later in life and then you're like oh my god I mean examples were always around me and they actually enable me to be where I'm at so I don't know I just wanted to say this because that question was kind of bugging me I was like okay I need to talk about this I need to tell uh, you know young minds because when I was I was in school, I never thought of myself as, oh, I'm a girl, because my school was very inclusive in terms of gender, in terms of everything. But it's when I moved out, I saw that there are actually problems that we need to navigate, that there might be actual challenges that we might have to, you know, go through. Like, there is casual sexism. And you are all of a sudden the only woman in the room. And it's all men. But if I talk from Birla's perspective, it's hands down the best school uh, in Hawaii. I mean, yeah, I never felt that way. Just that when I stepped out of there, I, I felt I had a gender or, you know, that people were looking at me differently. Uh, I've never felt so supportive. And I hear stories from people thank all my teachers. No problem to you guys. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Well, I'm sure we all agree with your words. Uh, at the end, I would like to extend a very big thank you to you, Ms. Ramana, Ms. Dukriti, Ms. Neeti, Ms. Neha, Ms. Vidushi, and Ms. Anjana. We're all thankful that you gave us uh, this mind of information. I'm sure it has left us all motivated today. Well, who runs the world with girls? Thank you. <laughs>